Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome. Uh, as uh, Jody said, uh, my name is Anne Ellis, uh, and this is my presentation on. It's not moving. Hold on. There we go. Okay, I think we got it now. This is my presentation called To Quiet, an Introvert's Experience of Leading Ministry. As Joey said, my name is Anne Ellis. I am currently in ministry at Summerland United Church in beautiful Summerland, British Columbia. And on that note, I want to say an extra special good morning uh, to those on the West Coast who got up very early for this live stream. <laughs> There's quite a few of them on there. Good morning. Uh, so my question that I researched uh, was, what does it feel like to lead worship as an introvert in congregational ministry? I am an introvert in congregational ministry, and I know what my experience is, and I was curious if it was just me or if other introverts have similar experiences. The research method I used was phenomenology, and I chose to focus specifically on worship because it requires a lot of talking, being fully present to your community, being upfront, and being on, as they say. And these are very energy draining practices for introverts. Yet it is also the work that we are called to. So how do we live into a call that is ideally life-giving, but can also be lead to exhaustion and to burnout? In a sermon I gave once, I spoke about my introversion. And after the service, a member came up to me and said very forcefully, you can't be an introvert. You're not antisocial. There we go. All the introverts in the room just were like, I have heard this. Um, <laughs> and so another reason for this study is to provide a better understanding of what introversion is. All of my participants commented on having a similar experience. They are not antisocial either. Many of them enjoy social gatherings, parties, being with friends, and the social and public aspects of their jobs. However, these activities tend to drain their energy, leaving them tired and worn out after being in large crowds for a time. They find rejuvenation and energy restoration in being alone, often in nature, hiking, skiing, riding a bike, engaging in quiet, solitary activities at home, such as reading, uh, watching TV, meditating. And as one participant said, just being with myself for a while. I'll give you time to read my comic. We good? So Adam McHugh, fellow introvert and author of Introverts in the Church, Finding Our Place in an Extroverted Culture, says that introversion and extroversion do not describe categories of people, but are two separate forces within a person. Everyone has the capacity to look outward into the world of things, activities, and events, as well as the capacity for searching inward to the world of thoughts, feelings, imagination, and ideas. And all of our personalities can move in these two directions. Introversion and extroversion is a spectrum. And each participant of mine placed themselves on various points along that spectrum, some saying that they were extreme introverts and others saying they had introvert tendencies. 
Now, an ongoing joke throughout this whole entire project was, how on earth are you going to get these introverts to talk to you? And the reality is I had to turn participants away. I had so many people want to share their experiences and talk to me that I had to not interview everyone that I could have. Introverts want to be heard and they want to be understood. And it's often not about not wanting to talk. It's often about wanting to talk about things that they're passionate about. And when we get going, we'll talk your ear off. So I interviewed five self-identified introverts of different genders, despite my choice of pseudonyms, and different Christian denominations. And they all had quite a lot to say about the following three themes. The energy within, authentic energy, and the energy without. My participants all expressed a love of leading worship and a great deal of joy in the work that they do. However, other emotions also come along with this leadership. Emotions such as worry, nervousness, forgetfulness, anxiety, and even dread. Sarah said, I love leading worship, it feeds my soul. Sharing a sermon though is a performance piece. That's more of an extroversion skill, so it's exhausting. Sundays are exhausting. And Nora said before, lead, before every worship, my heart was bracing. Abby said, I agonize beforehand. Betty said, it's always uncomfortable. I've been preaching for 20 years now, and I'm never not nervous. And Faye said, I can feel a sense of peace, a closeness of God, and I can be overtaken by insecurity. When asked about whether or not their faith was nourished during the leading of worship, most said yes. However, others said that it was during the prep work and the quiet time of planning a service that nourishes their faith and gives them a spiritual connection. Betty said, I can't speak for everyone, but a lot of what calls me into the work I do is through a book, right? And the way that God speaks to me is through scripture. And the fact that books are a way I access my inner world makes scripture very accessible to me. And then I overprepare excessively. And in the end, I delete 20 hours of work because it's ridiculous. <laughs> and Nora said, I think the spiritual connection for me happens while I'm preparing because in a way, leading worship is a performance. As I reflected on these comments, uh, what came to mind was the way that we hear Jesus's baptism told in Mark 1, verses 9 to 15. And yes, Mark is very succinct in all of his writing, but it would seem in this chapter that the focus is the words spoken by God at the baptism and the words spoken by Jesus when he begins his ministry. That long 40 days of meditation, silence, and quiet in the desert are barely commented on. But it is only through those 40 days of quiet meditation, silence, and being alone in the desert is Jesus able to move into his ministry. But the Gospels, and in particular the red letter versions, the focus is on the words of Jesus. They literally highlight them. And his nonverbal actions, such as the 40 days in the wilderness, his time spent alone on mountainsides and hillsides and lake shores and praying in gardens, is easily lost or dismissed among the highlights. 
in the same way, the time that clergy spend crafting a worship service through study, reading, planning, and prayer is often dismissed. And many assume that clergy have plenty of free time during the week because you really only work on a Sunday, right? This, of course, is not true just for introverted clergy alone. Yet for introverted clergy, this time of study, prayer, and reflection is often when they find that sense of spiritual connection, which is often missing during the leading of worship and is their opportunity for rest and rejuvenation. Several of my participants commented on feeling slightly disembodied and outside of themselves during the leading of worship. And while uncomfortable, a few of them said it was a place where they felt that spirit could enter. Betty said on leading worship is that leading worship is the antithesis of my introversion. So it's one of those things where Christ bids you to come and die so that you might live. To some degree, parts of my natural personality get subjected to God's will to make me a different kind of person. And I've kind of wrestled this out a lot because often God and I talk and I ask, why on earth would you call me to do this stuff? And why wouldn't you just put me together in a way that would be more conducive to that? And she said, I think the answer I've had from God is because my power is in perfect weakness. He needs me to know that it's so outside of me. It's definitely him. This sense of kenosis, the emptying of oneself, was commented on by other participants and is a topic I will explore more fully in my final paper. My participants expressed varying degrees of feeling like Sunday morning worship was a performance and they were there to put on a show. And not only was it their job to provide a nourishing and spirit-filled worship experience, they also needed to manage the moving parts of a service. And while Abby clearly stated that they know it's not a solo act, there's often a lot of other people working to put together a service, and of course God is always present, they can feel like an air traffic controller trying to keep it all together <laughs> on a Sunday morning. And so this sense of performance, the need to be an actor, director, stage manager, and occasionally even the musician, can make clergy feel a level of self-doubt about who they are as ministers. Are they truly called to ministry? Are they truly capable of being what God and our communities of faith want when such or yeah, when such an integral part of the call can be such a challenge and leave them feeling not spiritually fulfilled, but worn out. Adam McHugh, again in Introverts in the Church, writes about many of the clergy that he interviewed feeling very similar. He quotes uh, psychology professor Richard Beck saying, in some churches, spirituality is equated with sociability. So, he goes on, when an evangelical community explicitly or implicitly encourages our ever-expanding social web, our resistance to it as introverts can produce feelings of spiritual inadequacy. And while Ms. McHugh is speaking primarily about clergy in large evangelical ministries in the United States, the same sentiments apply to any introverted clergy, regardless of their denomination or the size of their church population. In Susan Cain's book, Quiet, the best introvert book ever, um, <laughs> 
Chapter nine is titled, when should you act more like an extrovert than you really are? And she poses these questions. Should we as introverts manipulate our behavior or should we simply remain true to ourselves? And at what point does controlling our behavior become futile or exhausting? And my wondering in relation to this, this project was, in doing so, are we presenting an inauthentic self during worship? And Susan Cain writes in the chapter that the best answers to these questions can be found in psychologist Brian Little's work on free trait theory. According to free trait theory, we are all born and culturally endowed with certain personality traits, introversion, for example. But we can and do act out of character in the service of core personal projects. So introverts can act like extroverts for the sake of work they consider important, for people they love, or anything they highly value. The genius of Little's theory, writes Kane, is how neatly it resolves this discomfort of acting out of character. Yes, it would seem we're pretending to be extroverts, but it's in the service of love or a professional calling. And so introverted clergy can put on this pseudo extroversion, not to be fake or false or inauthentic, but rather because they're working from a place of deeply held values of love for God and love for people. My participants all expressed a love for their congregation members and love for the stewardship that they provide both in worship leadership and other areas of their call. Betty said, he stirs up a love for me, for my people. And so in that place on a Sunday morning, when I see them all together week after week, that's what he's stirring up. It's just, I love these people, they're so beautiful. And he puts that same love in my heart to love them and encourage them too. And Sarah said, Sunday worship is connecting with God and spirit, but it's also connecting with people. There's something spiritual about being really well connected with people that are all doing this thing together. When I'm with God, he's encouraging me to pay attention to people. And so because of this love for people and love for God, introverts can extrovert as needed without any feelings of resentment. Yet at the same time, it's exhausting. So you'll remember Sarah at the beginning, she said sharing a sermon is like a performance piece. It's very extroverted. So Sundays are exhausting. And when asked what others felt about when worship was concluded, uh, some of the feedback I had was on a Sunday morning, I spent two hours at church and I come back and I'm drained. And Abby said, I feel spent. One of the hardest things is the handshaking sometimes. I'll just slip out the side rather than go to the front door. Well, it did that again. Betty said, there's a lot of people in my life who don't believe I'm an introvert because I'm always extroverting and I can pull it off. I kind of know when I get to that place, I haven't been with myself for a while. And then I get to that place and I realize, oh, I'm very depleted in my soul. I'm not really going to be able to bring my best to the world. And I can only find myself in silence. My participants expressed that one of the hardest parts about Sunday worship was the expectations their congregation members had for them. They all shared that not only are they trying to keep everything organized for worship, they're also managing their internal anxiety, worries, and doubts. And this can make it very difficult to concentrate and remember things. And it means setting some boundaries on how others can use their energy on a Sunday morning. 
In speaking about how they feel before a service starts, Abby said, I can't really talk to people, yet everyone wants a piece of me. I've put it in the bulletin now. If you say anything to me on a Sunday, there's no guarantee I've actually listened or heard or retained it. So please send me an email or call me. Like Abby is brilliant, right? Like, <laughs> and Betty related a story about being asked to add an announcement last minute on a Sunday morning because the person assumed, well, you're already up there, to which she responded, and I really hope it was in her head, do you understand how many hamsters are running around in my brain right now? <laughs> and Faye said the pulpit, the stage, has not always been a safe place because people can be very critical of the things that take place, whether it's music or whether it's preaching or whether it's prayer. Clergy, believe it or not, are human. I know, take that in. Introverted clergy, by stepping into this extroverted aspect of ministry, come with a higher level of vulnerability. We might see a self-possessed, confident, and engaged worship leader standing at the front of the church, but that's not always what's happening internally. Nora uh, talked about being asked, uh, you don't look nervous up there, to which she responded, that's because I've practiced. I've learned how to do it. But I'm always nervous, and you just get used to being nervous. And one participant spoke of anxiety so acute that even after decades of leading worship, they can't eat on a Sunday morning. So they get so nauseous that they've turned it into a spiritual practice of fasting as a way to manage that nauseous feeling every time they have to step into the pulpit. So on the day of, I always fast. It sounds super religious, but it's more psychological because preaching gives me digestive issues. I'm so nervous, I feel like I couldn't possibly eat. Now, this isn't to say that introverted clergy should be free of comment or critique, just as a reminder to people that clergy, introvert or not, are not invulnerable to careless judgments made by community members. Expecting all clergy to act a certain way, shake everyone's hand at the door after service and be that social butterfly at coffee time, and then become critical of the clergy when that's not who they are, can do a great deal of harm. The result of this criticism uh, is that when I asked one participant how they feel when worship is concluded, they said, unsafe. Unsafe. Very vulnerable. So I asked my participants if they would change anything in worship to better suit their introversion, and every single one of them said no. But they would change it for their introverted members. Every single one of them commented on how happy they were to do away with the passing of the peace during COVID, and none of them wanted to bring it back. <laughs> It's chaotic, said Abby. As an introvert, said Nora, it makes me uncomfortable. Faye, when asked what they would change or add, said, I would add just freedom. Freedom for people to be, to worship as they want to worship and feel comfortable. I don't like forcing people to do those classically extroverted things. It's fascinating because even in the more contemplative denominations, it's still extroverted in how we are together in worship. And those moments of silence are just so awkward. You can feel the tension in the place and it's not a sweet silence, but a forced silence. Abby said, 
I always laugh that in every bulletin, I have a time for quiet reflection after the sermon, and we go straight into the hymn. I don't know why I have it there, and then just ignore it. Then she paused, and mostly I think it's because I'm looking at the clock and going, oh my God, we're over time. And Faye said, some churches view blank space as the radio does. Oh, we've got dead air. We're going to lose the people. Well, no, that's not how we should view it in church. Those pauses, those spaces are meant to be. And we can treat them as holy spaces where we're pausing on purpose for reflection to allow the spirit of God to catch up. So understanding the needs of introverted clergy, I think help us also to understand the introverted members of our communities and what their needs are and how we might accommodate them. And as we work towards broadening our welcome into more expansiveness and more inclusion and inclusivity, understanding introversion, I think helps us understand a wider range of neurodiversity within our communities. And so the questions we need to be asking ourselves is how do we honor the needs of introverts in our communities, both clergy and lay? And how do we as introverted clergies set and honor our boundaries? With a better understanding of introverts, Perhaps we can look at the quiet members of our communities and enter into that quiet with them rather than seek to draw them out. Perhaps we as introvert clergy can encourage our communities to practice holy silence, that sweet, quiet place where we hear God. Perhaps we can honor the power of quiet and honor our call to quiet. Thank you very much, everyone, for being here today. An extra special thanks to Jody Sinis, or Jody Clark and Dave Sinis. Well, I mixed you two up. For all of your support throughout this entire project, I am so grateful for all for you and for all of my classmates. Thank you very much for being here today. <laughs> and in the spirit of the presentation, let's take a, a moment of silence. And thank you. Comments, questions, queries? Or you want to sit still for a while? That's cool too. <laughs> we got one here in my hair. Done. Hi, Anne. Thank you so much for your presentation. Don Lee Greer, uh, alum and present student in the MA program. Um, I'm a 51% extrovert and 49% introvert, believe it or not, I am introverted quite a bit, um, and I really appreciated your project. My question for you is, during your research, uh, you talked about boundaries briefly, okay. and did at any point in time, did your participants discuss boundaries that they've established in worship? That's a really awesome, I'm trying to think about what they've established if specifics um i don't think so i'd have to go back and look into the research and, and see if it was there it wasn't a specific question that i asked um so but i think the the boundaries before service was was quite a bit of what got talked about 
and, and then their own boundaries that unofficially they keep after service of, of a few of them don't go to the door to shake hands. They'll like busy themselves with tidying the lectern or something um, and, and sort of try to look busy so that they're not feeling like they have to go to the door. <laughs> This, they were primarily, um, Abby spoke about, you know, putting in the bulletin, like, I can't guarantee I'm going to remember anything you tell me. Um, and uh, Betty's saying, you know, please don't give me last minute things. And uh, I think a couple others said, said similar, like, like, I'm, I'm kind of focused on worship. Everything else that is a part of church leadership needs to come to me on a different day. Come over to uh, the nerve center. Thank you. I'm Samuel, and I'm a student here at AST. And uh, I love quiet, and I hate uh, the passing of the peace. <laughs> um, you spoke about you spoke about spiritual fulfillment mm -hmm. um, and finding spiritual fulfillment um, as we lead our congregations in worship, but also, um, you know, how our energy is depleted in, in the process of providing leadership. Mm -hmm. I wonder if anyone spoke about how they experienced spiritual fulfillment despite um, having their energy depleted. Yeah, um, they did quite a bit. And uh, one of the, the two places that they commented the most on spiritual fulfillment and nourishing of faith was in the singing of hymns. Um, so that's a, a bit of their, you know, you're, you're not as upfront leading, unless you're the musician as well, and a couple of them were. Um, and then also communion, uh, serving communion and, and being a part of the Eucharist. Uh, and that quiet time of, of serving was really important for, I say four of the five yeah commented on that as being the places where they gain they gain a little bit of that nourishment back so that then you know then probably expend it out <laughs> as they're leading prayers or doing sermons yeah yeah we're going to go to a question online from andy o'neill a faculty member here at ast uh, he says, excellent questions about introverts in ministry, a group that some surveys estimate as comprising 70% of clergy. Yep. You drew an important connection between introverts being able to exercise extroversion as a result of their love for their congregants. I'm wondering if your research revealed what happens when those relationships enter into conflict and whether that changes the introvert's capacity for extroversion. Oh. And just... Uh, as an aside, Ron Shaw also asks, or he, he says he appreciated how much you explained the counterintuitive nature of introversion. He sits at the borderline, and he asks, was Jesus an introvert? Because I think it relates to that conflict question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, the conflict question, uh, definitely. I had uh, one, one participant who has been on the receiving end of, um, or embroiled in or however you want to word it like has had conflict within their their communities of faith and it makes it a lot harder for them to uh to put themselves out there and that's so that that feeling of unsafe that feeling of vulnerability of of not knowing basically they said the service ends and and they're they're waiting for somebody to tell them what they screwed up this time and so that makes it hard for them to extend themselves out and and that vulnerability that you do have to put yourself in to be up here uh and it definitely made it a lot harder uh and gave them much more sense of insecurity and and self-doubt about themselves and their call um the Jesus is Jesus an introvert? Um, that is open for debate. Uh, there's actually, again, in, in the book, Introverts in the Church, which is a great book, by the way, um, there's a lot of discussion about whether or not Jesus was an introvert. And I, if I'm remembering correctly, 
He talked about a study done at a seminary in the States where the students were asked to do a Myers-Briggs for Jesus and guess. And I think, and I might be wrong in this, so please don't you know, hold me to it. I think what they discovered was students who lean towards introversion made Jesus an introvert. Those that led lean towards extroversion saw Jesus as an extrovert. And the same with Paul. Um, and so the, the, because Jesus does both, he talks and he sermons and he, and, and there's lots of red letter, but he also spends a lot of time in silence. Paul writes letters. So he, he, so people wonder, is he an introvert? Because he primarily wrote letters and sent them off and had other people read them. So, yeah. I feel like I'm at a, at a meeting. I'm Ross and I'm an introvert. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, 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 I know, I know where the family is. Um, uh, Ross Bartlett, the uh, United Church Formation Director uh, here at AST. And according to the Myers-Briggs, I am an off-the-chart introvert. Me too. Yeah. And I have learned to be a professional extrovert when I need to be. And you pay a big price for that. And so everything that you said is so validating. That hour after worship was the worst hour of the week, which leads to my which sort of leads to my question comment. I wonder with your group, how much of their comfort, shall we say, with leading worship, and I agree that, I'm sorry, the people who say that they worship when they're leading worship, yeah, you're all lying. Um, <laughs> at least from my, from my experience, because they like that, you, you just don't do that. But I'm wondering about, like, for me, it was the controlled aspect of mm -hmm. leading worship you knew what was going to happen even yeah. when it went off the yeah. rails you knew where the rails were yeah. and it's the uncontrolled things yeah. that were challenging and i wonder if that was was true for your your group and because that goes into the wider aspects of of ministry yeah absolutely um I, they're they're indirectly uh the commenting about you know it's a performance piece they have everything written out They've got they've got their notes. They know exactly what's going to happen, and they're in they're in control of what's going to happen. They know that a couple commented that they know they're not going to get interrupted. They're not going to get over talked. They they have the floor, and for introverts, you don't often have the floor because there's a, a pause, a, a bit of silence, and and somebody who's extroverted has to fill that silence, <laughs> and so. And, and so knowing that they were going to be heard uh, actually came up uh, for a couple of my participants as being really important because they hadn't had that experience in their lives. Hi, I'm Susan. I'm more of an extrovert, but I'm learning how to function introverted sometimes, and it's good. <laughs> Uh, I'm the academic dean, and it was a lovely presentation. I am curious because some of those things that your participant named, I, as an extrovert, would also say, don't tell me anything before or after mm -hmm. worship. I will not remember it. Please send me an email. Um, I also would say there is a certain amount of nervousness that goes mm -hmm. with, with preaching. So I think it would be really, really fascinating to be able to parse out within your you know sort of process what are what are the common things that are simply about the practice of ministry regardless yeah. of whether you're introverted or extroverted yeah um you know all of those sorts of things and i i wholeheartedly recognized in worship my need to work with the worship committee to provide those spaces where introverts can more fully absorb what's going on mm -hmm. and even to design worship that meets the needs of those who are more introverted. So yeah. for a number of years on Wednesday, we offered a candles and contemplation service that had very few words, has a music, quiet prayer. And it, it drew those folks for whom that 
was yeah. just what met their their yeah. needs and their souls. So uh, as a um, more extroverted person, I want to thank you for your presentation. You're really beautifully done. Thank you. Um, I think I think if there's an extrovert in next year's class, you could do what is an extroverted experience of leading worship. Like, and then, you know, we get two different sides of the coin. It would be very interesting. And I, as an introvert myself, I chose to focus on introversion and, and uh, but it would be very interesting to, to see the other side of the coin. Uh, Rob Fennell, I'm on faculty here. I, I uh, wonder in your, in your final work, if you might incorporate that uh, verse from Leviticus, which says after worship, thou shalt go home and have a nap which is well uh, really yeah that's in leviticus that's, Somebody, it is again. it's quite important it's all everything you need is in leviticus <laughs> exactly yeah um my uh i need a pen my, to write this down yeah my question is um a theological question and that is to say and there's a part a and a part b and it's okay if you pass on b okay uh a is is does god make us introverted and b mm -hmm. is it possible to be too introverted to be effective in ministry. Oh, those are those are great questions for next year's grad projects. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, the the psychology of nature versus nurture, and and whether or not you know you know, we are who we are. And, and again, this free trait theory, psychology, and, and, and so much of how, how we're raised, I think plays into it. I think we do, we are born with natural tendencies. Um, and, and then how we are culturally raised, um, that can, you know, make those tendencies blossom or wither. Um, and so I'm going to, I'm going to avoid the direct answer of whether God does this. Uh, and, um, I think that there probably there probably is. Actually, no, I'm not going to answer that either. No, I don't know. Well, carry it, carry it, All right. Yeah. Okay. Then with me, or I'll encourage grad projects next year. Yeah. I'll email. Maybe I'll email you later. Yeah. So next year. Yeah, um, Nick, first year MDiv student. Um, I really like the recommendation of, of, you know, having quiet as part of worship, you know, mm -hmm. as, as an introvert. And I actually, I mean, I used to belong to a church one point in time that actually, you know, it had like a sign, like no talking in the sanctuary, right? Because they wanted people to be in a holy place of, of quiet before and after worship. And so you'd have to wait till you got over to the hall um, to start talking, which I thought was, was great. Um, and then my question, um, which not really to that, but really to your thing generally is, um, did you find that people, um, you know, these introverted people over the, the course of their lives um, ever had unhealthy habits of managing their introversion versus moving to healthy ones? And I'll just use my, my example is I used to smoke cigarettes for years. And the reason I did that is because it gave me an excuse once an hour to say, I'm just going to slip away for 10 minutes and I'd go outside and smoke yeah, a cigarette yeah, and nobody would bother yeah. me. Yeah, that's... Um, so, yeah. Um, that none of, none of my participants spoke to that. They never, they didn't share any of that, but, um, you know, they're, they might have been on their best behavior and giving me <laughs> the, the good answers of, of how to deal with uh, introversion. And so I, I don't, I don't know. I don't have an answer to that question. Julie MDiv program. Um, just another question uh, about the introversion, extroversion. Wondering if um, in the beautiful presentation, by the way. Thank you. In the methodology, it would have been interesting, I wonder, to ask about do we have to also ask questions to the extroverts or those who identify as extroverts just to see if there really is um, that separation of experiences you know, mm -hmm. are they absolutely within these two different camps, so to speak? And then the other question was around um, the kenosis, that self-emptying aspect. 
I would be interested to know if that is exclusive of introverts um, because my experience so far has been initially I'm present, but then very soon after that, I'm no longer present and mm -hmm. I, I don't feel like it's me up there. I wonder if it is exclusive to introverts, if that means there's actually, um, I don't like to use the term advantage, but there's a spiritual component uh, that is present for them, that is not present for others, that I would want to counter as meaning that they are not less um, appropriate in the role. Yeah, yeah, and I, again, I focused very specifically on introverts and so don't have any data on, on whether these would be applicable to extroverts. And I, you know, again, we're all people and we're, we're not really one or the other, like we're, we're in the spectrum. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be at all surprised if a lot of these similar feelings and experiences, the kenosis, the, the other things would be experiences of extroverts as well. I just don't have the data for that. So there are a lot of questions online I'm gonna put three together because they highlight different aspects of worship and things around worship. So um, Philip Braden, uh, a, an AST student. Hi, Philip. Um, also West Coaster, good morning, if it's, if it's morning yet. Um, Barely. He, he wants to know if people talked about the uncomfortableness uh, of talking to the minister before service, not just after. And then Cindy Christie Brooks, uh, mm -hmm. not quite West Coast, but also quite early for her, um, asks if anyone talks about cameras and recording and posting worship. Mm -hmm. And Heather McCants, uh, AST's president, um, is curious about the impact of online worship. Um, and is online worship easier for introverts than in-person worship? So online worship, recordings, and talking before service. Okay. Um, so one of my participants talked about when services went to online for COVID, uh, she was terrified. Uh, it, it was more overwhelming to know she was going to be on camera and to be on, on YouTube or how, I can't remember the specifics of how they did their COVID worships. Uh, and so she, she spent quite a bit of time practicing. Uh, and getting comfortable in front of a camera. Um, and that didn't come up in my uh, with my other participants. Um, we didn't talk specifically about the differences of online versus in person, although most of the data was in person worship. Um, and if their congregations had online um, as sort of secondary, uh, it didn't. Other than with Abby, uh, that's the only time it came up. Um, talking to the minister before service. Um, a lot of my participants said that they, they might be in the sanctuary uh, doing setup, but then for the 15, 10 minutes before service starts, they go to their office uh, either to pray uh, put on their vestments, um, kind of do a little bit of prep, uh, pray. Uh, one of my participants said, usually the prayer before service is, dear God, help me. Um, and uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so that was, that was, I hope that answers your questions. Yeah. Good. Uh, so you can tell the introverts are really excited. There are all kinds of questions going around. We could probably go on for a while. Unfortunately, we do need to pause, stop, actually have a break. Introverts can go outside and relax for a few minutes, but not too much longer. I tell you what, it's uh, we need to take about a 10-minute break. So my suggestion is we're going to come back and start at five minutes past. Would that be okay? So five minutes to give us a bit of a break. Uh, and the introverts can find a place to curl up. And <laughs> So... Uh, but Anne, you took us on a wonderful journey and all the introverts are going, finally, somebody's telling our story and we really appreciate it. I, I'm a strong introvert and the, the thing that resonated with me for the first time I'd ever heard it was the over-preparation. Like yeah. I'm always over prep. I have too much material all the time. Everyone, like it's unbelievable. every one of I them. Hadn't, I, never, I hadn't heard that in, in the introverted material before. Anyway, you learn wonderful things in these projects, don't you? Uh, and thank you for taking us on an extraordinary journey into the quiet world of introverts.